Friends, please come to this session on innovation. Have you ever wondered if we could do the same machining that we do with a machine maybe half its weight? Have you ever wondered if this lamp here could give the same illumination with one hundredth of the power consumption? Probably not. But these are the areas where innovative solutions could possibly be found. So please uh, enjoy this session, this very interesting session on innovation, and for which I have with me Professor Dipankar. Dipankar did his Bachelor in Technology from IIT Mumbai in Electrical Engineering. And then he did his Master's and PhD from Rice University USA in Physics. He enjoyed the rare privilege of working in both experimenting, ex experimental and theoretical physics. On the experimental side, he worked on cutting-edge technology areas such as scanning probe, microscopy, and many other things, some of which I find it even difficult to pronounce. He has been a pioneer in the field of scanning probe microscopy, building systems from scratch when one did not have the luxury to buy an off-the-shelf product or a system. On the theoretical side, Dipanka solved a hundred-year-old but largely contemporary problem, that of solving Maxwell's equations exactly analytically. On completion of his PhD, Dipanka returned to India unlike many of our people who stay in the U.S. afterwards, and started a private research lab on his own in India. He started by building scanning probe microscopes, and then Dipanka's work took him to many other different, different areas. He has published several papers, scientific journals, papers, etc. And he's now associated for the past more than 12 years with IIT Bombay, as an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and teaches a course called Electronics Design Lab or EDL where students are urged to think on their own and design real working products from scratch. He also interacts with students in various IIMs and other management institutions in the country. At present, Dipankar is focused on creating tree labs a Linux-like movement in the invention domain and has been mobilizing people and institutions to participate in various ways. What was most interesting to me when I visited Dipankar's lab in IIT Mumbai was a, a paradigm shift. I thought innovation and research needed a lot of money. Somehow, the lab just doesn't give you anything of that feeling at all. It's a very, very frugal innovations lab. And that I found was very interesting. So with this very, very short introduction, let me hand over the stage to Dipankar. All yours. Uh, friends, I would like to pose more questions than give answers. Hopefully, the answers will come from many of you. But I would like to ask questions that perhaps many of you have asked independently. So it could be a recap. <clears throat> Maybe I'll go over to a brief presentation that I will uh, uh, I chose to talk on a subset of the whole field of innovation. Of course, innovation is a very over-publicized word these days. So I'm not really going to use the word innovation. And I will gradually make you converge to an idea called, which I would say, invention. And give you the feeling what I'm really talking about. So before I progress to the whole paradigm, and I will paradigm of what is it that will make us create world-class 
innovations, inventions, and take a step, leapfrog into the area where cutting edge technology is developed, as uh, Gautam was telling, right at your own home, so to say. So I like to step you through that. The framework in which I will converge to is called Tree Labs, and I'll give you a flavor of that. It's an exciting idea that many of us have been part of and pursuing it. So let me go ahead and ask some basic questions. First of all, it's obvious that high tech, the word high tech, is almost synonymous with not done here. I mean, almost every gadget that you see, including the ones I'm holding perhaps, or the ones we are seeing our stuff, is almost invariably imported. We don't seem to be doing technology leadership of any kind. I mean, I'm not talking about those rare few exceptions here. I'm talking about as a society, as a culture. We are not really doing anything that is out of the world. We seem to be very eager to be followers. And I ask that question, why is it so that we have this handicap? Now, this, is, this has puzzled me. Uh, at my personal level, I had the fortune to be associated with the name brand labs, working with premier scientists. The point that has eluded me is, if I look at the most richest people on the planet today, the industrialists, now I find a good 10% or plus are from this part of the world, and yet, Correct me if I'm wrong, I have not come across people who have the visions to set up the Bell Labs, the IBM Labs, the Xerox Parks of the world. It just seems that we are too eager to buy technology and go ahead and we are pretty good businessmen. We make business very well out of it. But it's a question that has lingered in my mind. What is it that is causing the Bell Labs and the IBM Labs and the Xerox Park to be absent in this part of the world? And I'm saying this not with a jingoist India-centric thing, but I'm talking about as an anomaly, a scientific anomaly that we are one fifth population of the globe and we don't see these things happening here. Well, some of our friends would probably say that, hey, we are maybe not good in those hard technologies, but we are really good in software. I have been a hacker, quote unquote, from my childhood days. And I can tell with assurance, I don't see really world class in anything of software that we are developing. I mean, again, exceptions apart. We seem to be doing lots of things which are routine, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about cutting edge. Let me give, offer an example. Perhaps most of you understand or have, have flavor of what is the open source movement, the free software movement. And I'm going to make a statement. I'm saying this free software movement, open source movement, is changing the world the lives of each and every one of you and many others on the street, it's changing in radical ways. Uh, would I get a raise of hands just to get a sense if anybody understands this? Okay, that's a fair number of hands, but a fair number also seem to be neutral about it. But for those people, let me offer an example. Most of you who did not raise your hands perhaps know for sure that the internet as we know today is radically changing our lives be it in technology, be it in education, governance, social networking, you name it, you know, everything seems to be hovering around the internet. And if I tell you that this internet as we know today would not exist if not for free software. Almost entire network that is making up the servers that make up the internet is every server that runs in data centers of Google and the likes are all running free software. Take that component away, the business doesn't work. You don't have the internet the way you see it. Mind you, it is not the Googles of the world are using because it's free, free as in you are not paying directly anything. But this stuff is actually of the highest quality. Why do I assert that? It's because if you take a look at all the premier supercomputers of the world, the majority of them are running Linux. Now, supercomputer people, you would, un you would probably agree that they have as much funds available to buy any software they want, but they are running this software 
the free software because it's good quality. Nothing else works. So that's precisely the point I'm trying to make here. And in that category, I would think that we are not really doing anything super class because if I look around and see how many of the people, my colleagues, my students, are actually working in this free software movement, claiming ourselves to be world superpower in software, it doesn't make sense. The two don't match up. So there seemed to be a big, big cultural hang-up. We are just hanging somewhere. And mind you, I use the word, one-fifth population of the globe. What are we doing in such an exciting environment that we seem to live in? So questions I'm sure many of you have asked, these sort of questions. And I'm not going to just keep going ahead with ranting about questions like these, complaining about what is happening. Let me offer you a glimpse of what is in store. I'm standing essentially after maybe close to uh, 45 minutes away from your lunch. Now, what typically happens is, let me offer you a tantalizing question. You all know what this is, kulfi. So I am very uh, curious to pose this question to the audience. Uh, the question is obviously there up on the screen. See, during the time of the Nawabs and the Badshahs, three, four hundred years back, we know documented evidence is there that they used to enjoy the iced deserts, the kulfis and the likes. How did they make ice in the middle of India at that point in time? We know they existed, but how did they make it? So you see that there was technology. And I'm not in that mode of saying that, oh, we should go back to the past. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there was simple technology to make ice, and we have forgotten. Can we revive the process of thinking? I'm not saying necessarily go back and pull those up. But right now, if we are sitting here and try to see what is it that we can do to revive a process that will allow us to do simple thinking about processes of technology, of science, that will allow very radical, out-of-the-box solutions to existing problems, and that can impact the whole world. I'm not thinking of it locally at all. Let's take some simple arithmetic. Most of you would have at least seen or used the standard, uh, your <coughs> these uh, treadmills. So the treadmills, uh, when I first came across it, the simple questions I had to ask was, and for those folks who are engineers, or at least the bare essence of science that is there, the simple question is, I'll take the raw, not even back of the envelope calculation. I'm doing it in my mind. I'm saying, let's say I am a 100 kg weight person. I'm standing on that mat. So that's 1,000 newtons going down. And if I have to pull that mat against a friction, I assume it's 0.1 coefficient, just making some numbers. So that's about 100 newtons. Pull it about one meter a second. What is the kind of energy that I have to supply to make this operation possible? What I see, the number is obvious. It's about 100 watts. And in the kind of worst case scenario, if the, if the mat is inclined, you actually would have to spend less because your component of the force is just going to make it slide. The point is, why is it that you open up any treadmill machine, you will see a 2, 3 HP motor sitting there. What happened? Where did the remaining go? And it's not just about the treadmill. I'm just saying it's a genie out of the box. The moment you start seeing things around from now, rest assured that you will be asking these questions yourself. The ubiquitous ceiling fan. How efficient? Now here, this is a pop no marks quiz. I would, I would request a couple of hands to just answer, uh, make guesses. There's no right or wrong about it. How efficient do you think is the ceiling fan which hovers around everywhere? Any, 80, 80. There's an 80 percent there. 20 percent. 30 percent. 10 percent. 80. Okay. Overall efficiency. OK. So OK. Now let me, let me be fair. I think I have defined the efficiency figure over there. What I'm saying is I'm calling a device a fan. 
Its purpose is to deliver kinetic energy into air. So therefore, I should look at what it is doing as a fan. So that is kinetic energy. So I'll take the energy that it has imparted to the air, and then I'll divide by what I have put in. To me, that is fair enough. That's a fair definition of efficiency. Now that number, ladies and gentlemen, if you are lucky, if you are lucky, you have a right. And mind you, what came shocking to me when I, by the way, this is again back of the envelope calculation. Anybody who has done, you know, perhaps even high school uh, science would be able to derive the numbers. It's just doing half mv squared. You know the density of air. You know the velocity at which air can be flowing. The point is, what happened? I mean, the average ceiling fan on, the, on your ceiling is a heater in your room. <laughs> Have you touched the hub of the fan? Why is it so hot? It's sitting in an airflow regime to start with. For those who have worked with soldering irons, on a lump of metal that big, you put a soldering iron, I'm pretty certain it doesn't get that hot. So the point is, and what disturbed me most is when I started to look at the engineering aspect of what is it that was happening, I found, uh, it, this is a more recent thing, you know, there, there's a whole history, but I'm thinking the most recent thing is manufacturers have deliberately made the fan energy inefficient in order for it to work with those tiny little regulators you find which are based on one SCR. So it's ridiculous, okay? I mean, the kind of energy we land up spending senselessly. Mind you, the energy we are consuming at our home with the end appliance, that's only 10% of what you use to generate it. So all of that drama that you do to generate it, make the machinery, transport it, and then finally, you are just wasting it away. That's essentially the paradox we are talking about. But it all starts from simple questions, back of the envelope calculations like what I'm telling you. So what is the solution? I'm not here to offer solutions. I'm here to learn as much, but let me just quote This uh, invention is the word I would like to use. I'm not ready to talk about just an incremental innovation. I'm using the word innovation in that sense, that it mostly connotes something that you're doing incrementally, something that does 5%, 10%, 30% better. I want to talk about invention, a radically different way of looking at things, based on fundamentally simple premises of your understanding basic science, basic engineering. And this tool should be so powerful that it should empower most of us. It's simple enough, that's why it will empower most of us to see that, hey, we can literally take on the world. I mean, not in that aggressive arms race kind of thing. I'm talking about delivering actual solutions. So because I've used the word invention, and my suggestion is we need to look at inventions to solve the many, many different problems that we are seeing. Let me give a glimpse of what I mean by an invention. And here I have a little demonstration. So I hope, uh, I hope people far away can get a glimpse of it. So here's a pop quiz. Here is a little camera bag. What do you think could it, could it be? Now this is a tough question, just a guess. I mean, it doesn't seem to be very heavy. So I will, uh, I, I'll want to tell you that I'm actually holding an arc welding machine in this bag. The kind of machines that you see in the, any standard workshops, which are big boxes on, which come on wheels, and portability means it comes on wheels, basically. So I'm holding a gadget that is this. This is a prototype. Anyone? Anyone here has experience with welding? So uh, I'll volunteer just to, yeah, maybe just to hold it. What would be your guess of the weight for this machine? 
you don't go to the market, do you? <laughs> no, not at all. That's an easy giveaway. Excellent. That gentleman is definitely someone who... Anyway, this is about a couple of kgs. So, but this is actually quote-unquote a replacement. Quote-unquote because you will see there are differences. A replacement for almost a 200 kg giant, conventional giant. So without much ado, I want to give a short demo here. So I'm going to plug it in with a standard power cord into a standard power socket. And it's completely live. It's OK. It's OK. It's fine. It's OK. So, uh, so it's completely live and hot. And as you know, for those of you who have done actually welding, we know that we shouldn't be touching these terminals at all, OK? But I'm just, I, I'm just holding them right here. OK, you want to put it there? Sure. OK, so this looks like a toy. It behaves like a toy, so it must be a toy. So what I'll do for a demonstration, I'm taking a couple of hacksaw blade pieces, the regular hacksaw blade that we buy in the market. And I'm just going to show you a glimpse of uh, what would be, OK. okay let me test. So mind you, I'm holding these pieces with my bare hands. For those who are far away, if you can see, and I'm touching this electrode. This is a prototype, not exactly what a welding machine should be doing, but you will get the idea. And I start the process. And for those of you uh, who are far away, you can see that I've essentially done a welding with. Now, I am not a welding expert at all. For people who are experts, they have come and taught me a lot. And they have been telling me, hey, look, this is doing such and such thing. Okay. So with their collective wisdom, I started to become more and more wise. Now, one thing I learned is, one of the first things experts tell me, wait a minute, fine, you did the welding. But I think you, are, you have just welded high carbon steel. It's not supposed to be welded, weldable in this sense. Okay. Arc welding is not possible on this one. This is a high carbon steel. So what did you do? In fact, you can actually use the standard welding electrodes. Now, I've just cut a little piece, and a bare amount of the flux is still around. So what I will do is I'll try to show uh, welding with the standard electrodes themselves. And let me put it this way. Again, pardon my being not, not an expert in this. So if I can do it, most of you will be able to certainly do it. So we do this, and it's, it looks as simple as the following. Sorry. I think it's welded. OK, so this piece is welded. And what I will, uh, I'll just let it cool. I've done a couple of other pieces over here similarly. So if you can just uh, pass around a few pieces to just check people. So this is actually welding. And here I use the standard electrodes. Mind you, the, the most important part in this, and this is where the tree lab concept really comes in. This whole thing stemmed from simple thinking, nothing complicated. So, not being an expert, I had to ask questions that every child can ask. So, when I was doing my welding, when I was a student in IIT in the workshops, uh, you know, we have the courses. What I I mean, it used to be like quite an intimidating affair. You know, your electrodes will get stuck, and you're trying to see through those 
you know, those shields which you can barely see anything through it. I'm sure many of you who have done welding would have similar experience. But what dawned on me was, and all of you have seen this, if you see a standard welding, arc welding happening, you see the whole place is just lit up, just completely lit up. That it's almost like you have powerful arc movie projectors which are putting on the wall, everywhere. And mind you, that's only the visible part of the radiation. The invisible UV part is so strong that you actually have to put your jackets and gloves and shields to protect yourself. My question was the following. If I'm doing welding right here to weld a piece, all the photons are up on the walls. They're delivering their energy on the wall, not on the weld. So can we, I mean, is that necessary? Can we eliminate that? And it's easy to calculate. What is the quantum of energy that is actually going on the walls? You can measure it. And then what happened? You just do step by step by step in that process. And one to the next to the next. It's a nonlinear process. Each thing is not just adding to the previous improvement, but it's acting nonlinearly to improve it. And lo and behold, we start to have things that start to look like little magic shows. I mean, by conventional standards. But this is not the last word. There are ways ahead to go on this platform. So I, I hope I have given a little glimpse of what I mean by an invention. So I'll use that in my context now to give you a sense. Uh, well, a few more examples before that. Sorry? Uh, sure. Uh, we have been in discussion, yes. Uh, sorry, the question was, have I interacted with any welding manufacturers or transform manufacturers? Or fan manufacturers. Or? Fan also. Or fan manufacturers. What is the reaction? Um, yes, the reaction is that, uh, firstly, of disbelief that it is possible. But I think they are, by and large, positive in uh, their ability to interact. And that's really the framework that we are trying to create, a framework in which we can actually engage the whole variety of different uh, processes. And I will come to what this tree lab thing is. You'll get the clearer picture of it. So, so another example over here, again, something that almost every home has. And again, a little anecdote, short anecdote. The average water pump in your domestic use that you use is really, really energy inefficient. And it doesn't take an Einstein to figure this out. I was on my terrace up on some seven, eight stories, and water was overflowing late night from the tank, overhead tank. So, so it just took me a little measurement with a bucket count 1001, 1002, and you fill up the bucket and see how much water came out. So roughly it was about a liter a second. And again, not even back of the envelope calculation, you're saying, OK, one liter is one kg, and therefore it has come up about 30 meters. So that should be about 300 joules of energy spent per second. But then immediate realization is, why is the pump down there running off a 10 HP motor? I had no answer to that. Initially, I thought that I must be doing something wrong. But friends, I don't think there was anything wrong with that, as you can figure out. MGH is something we learn in high school. So there could not be anything really wrong about it. And that's the state of affairs. It seems we have forgotten how to ask the simple questions. The core, core thinking has to be simple. If you are thinking complicated, perhaps we are going somewhere else. Here is an interesting thought. Nothing to do with technology directly. But let me offer this. As, a, uh, as an idea. See, we are talking about green, and we are talking about everything under the planet. And what we see is the food that we eat every day. Each one of us who live in an urban setting, we are eating food every day. And probably we don't think much about it. But remember, this food was not grown in that urban setting. It was not grown in that urban setting. It was it doesn't, it happens. So the food had to be transported hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers by burning fossil fuel. 
It was irrigated with pumps that was energized directly or indirectly with fossil fuel. The fertilizers we use are based on fossil fuel. The quote unquote poisons, the pesticides are fossil fuel based. And you keep naming it, okay? Including your intermediate storage or even in your home when you are doing it, the packaging, the disposal, everything is fossil fuel, fossil fuel, fossil fuel written ad infinitum. And it shocked me to, when we did the little arithmetic, other people have also done it. It seems that even a benign thing as a single tomato, just one tomato we take for granted, in an urban setting could take off almost to the tune of one third liter of oil equivalent of energy for it to reach your plate. So clearly, it's not a sustainable model at all. We may be thinking of energy efficiencies all over, but look at the food the way we are consuming it today. It's just not possible to sustain it in the way we are doing it. If we don't have a solution, you know what the result would be. We won't have food, we will be into all kinds of problems that could arise out of it. There was just a thought, I thought I'll share it with you in the spirit of energy efficiency. If we can get rid of this fossil fuel dependence on the food that we eat, we would have helped the planet in more than one way. So here comes the core idea about tree labs, and I would like to essentially emphasize it with a short film which comes subsequently, but let me go ahead with saying, I've been saying tree is an acronym. Tree stands for, the T stands for think simple, as I've been emphasizing. R for follow it up with research. Little bit of more that Edison's 99% perspiration part. So don't just leave it as an idea sitting in your head, make it happen by actually persevering. Then our motto is don't just let it sit as an idea in the lab that happens a lot in certain sections. Let it go out and our model is how to create entrepreneurial model out of it so that the products and the solutions which the simple solutions we have arrived at could be seen in society and the benefits. And the last Eve of tree is an interesting thing which will take me more than the time allotted here to think. It stands for evolve and part of the framework in which tree, tree labs has been decided to become a GANU Linux like movement. So it's the power of the community that can fuel it. So it's an interesting model but let me go ahead with it. So here are some thoughts by well branded people and the tree labs' mode of thinking is inventing is an algorithm. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's not the preview of geniuses. It's about thinking simple, the tree that we have said. That is about what inventions, uh, what, that is what inventions are all about. And here I would also talk about that entrepreneurship, this part is dealing with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is also an algorithm. For the average person, it may seem like entrepreneurship is all about some lucky breaks. I mean, I'm not talking about a large majority of the people who have actually gone through the footsteps. I'm talking about, let's say, startups. I'm talking about people who have not had people to advise them on what entrepreneurship. It's like a whole clouded. But Andrew Carnegie's statement, I mean, seals it all. He said, there is no line of business in which success is not possible which essentially talks about an algorithm. You follow the algorithm, you get the solution. And the other person I like to quote is Arthur Rock. I mean, Arthur Rock, for those of you who are not aware of him, he is basically the father of venture capital. He had founded Fairchild, Intel, Apple, and many others. He's, what, he's the person who created what we call VC today. So his statement is, that if you are trying to essentially think of business as a quote unquote money making thing, it's not going to get you much further. You know, you may do something, but if you really want to do something which is outstanding, think of changing the world. So that's the, so I think these people were wise and their work showed it that they really could go with these simple beliefs and achieve what they have done. In a nutshell, the tree labs model, of which a short film can also tell you, uh, essentially what we have 
is a core, which is an inventing house, and we spin out entities which are taking inventions to the market. And there are a variety of models, but this thing which is owned by none and by the same token owned by everybody, it's, a, it's in the commons, has equity sharing into this and revenue sharing, etc. So it fuels back and therefore what we do is a segregating of the two. R&D partner which is getting fueled with serious corporate money as a partner not working in the mode of grants that you write to corporates or government grants or whatever else. It is actually a serious partner to multitude of corporates that we envision, which can take on the world in the right spirit. Uh, okay, so here I will, I'm just switching the gear just in the context of the audience to throw an interesting question, as I told you, I'll be asking questions. Uh, most machines that I have used, I do work on the lathes and the mill and the grinders myself. So what I find is everything is super bulky. I think Gautam was just alluding to it in his introduction. And the reason is very obvious. You don't want relative vibration, of the job and the tool. You don't want, you want good quality job to be done. So the point I'm trying to raise here is, in the same way that we have talked about the welding machine, is that bulk necessary? That bulk is cost. And it's not just about the bulk. There are a whole bunch of other components. Uh, allow me to offer a way of looking at it. I guess about the best, or the best quality precision, the quality precision that we are looking for is about a micron precision in the machining. The kind of linear encoders and the linear guideways and other stuff that we use in machine tools, automated machine tools, are expensive components. We all know that. And please educate me if there's any thinking in this community to do those indigenously. I was myself involved in part of machine tools some time back, and I had to always import my components all the basic components of the zero backlash ball screws and the linear guideways, everything. I was just, so the mechanical components were just not made. And I was wondering if that had to be like that. What is it that is really, I mean, we, have, we may have taken a path to those machines, but is there a way out of it? Is there a way of reducing the cost of these machines significantly? So a couple of ideas, and these are tree labs ideas which are actually being taken out in being taken out in the commercial space. If we can, the idea is very simple, and what I'm showing you is related to it. The idea is, can we achieve accuracy without bulk? Far more than the micron that we are looking for, relatively easily, with no fuss. If we can do that, then it's a paradigm shift from the conventional machining that we are talking about. Any of you have heard of waveguide laser? Waveguide CO2 lasers. I'm talking about a cutting tool can be a laser, which is the size of a, about this much, the size of a 12 inch ruler. It's a waveguide CO2 laser. Enough juice to cut through, gives about 50 watts, so you know what it can cut through. Certainly sheets and the likes. But couple that with the ability to position the tool and the job. The tool is, by the way, a laser, and the job with precisions which are unprecedented, but at a fraction of a cost of what conventional people have been able to do. So this, what you're seeing, I've written it there. This is an atomic resolution image. What you're seeing is atoms of carbon and this is a single atom of argon sitting on that lattice. This image was taken by instruments that was built by these hands. Nothing super out of the world. It was simple thinking. The people who had made, first made these machines, Heinrich Rohrer and Robert Binnig, they won the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, when they were first talking about it, everybody around them thought they were crazy. 
It's not possible, they said. It's not possible to uh, make such a thing. I'm talking about the premier scientific community told them. But they proved them wrong. They proved them wrong by making these machines. Now, you will understand the kind of precision we are talking about by this estimate. If you see, the way that image, like these images are done, is the following. By the way, one of my colleagues who is in IBM, Almaden, he wrote this IBM using single atoms of xenon or copper surfaces. So this is, uh, so what you, uh, allow me, if, if, I don't know if this is super clear, but uh, I'm actually, my pointer is only pointing to the center image. I can't simultaneously time multiplex it. Uh, so what, we, what is done is, you have a tip. A tip is nothing super different than a well-defined needle, a sharp. The idea being, at the end of it, there has to be one atom sticking beyond the rest. There has to be one which is sticking beyond the rest. So we are interested in that. I'm, now this atom is made to come closer and closer and closer to a surface. How close you can see, it's only about an atomic diameter. One atomic diameter away, you are putting two macroscopic objects coming closer and closer to each other. And I'm holding it there with the precision of one hundredth of an atomic diameter. And then, not just holding it, then I move it across. So as I move it across, I see these bumps. And that's what I get recorded over there. So line by line by line, images like this are constructed. It's fairly fast. It takes about 15 seconds or they're about to get an image like this. So this magnification that you are seeing of atomic resolution image is of the order of a thousand, hundred to a thousand times more powerful than the best electron microscopes. And here, as if it was not just a microscope, you can use this to actually manipulate things in the nano world. You can pick one atom at a time, just like this IBM was done, and put it where you want. Thinking at the background, extremely simple. The implementation, because I had the fortune to go in that as a pioneer, as building the first instruments, among the first instruments, there was nothing rocket science we were doing. It was just thinking simple, coming up solutions to problems one after another. And we were doing this. So what you see is here, for example, another situation, you sprinkle the atoms, so to say. Sprinkle means you just evaporate it. And you let them settle and you take an image. Then you start to push this atom over there, the second one over there, third one, and you start to pick the arc and eventually complete the arc. A completely man-made structure at the atomic scale. These are all reality, not science fiction. So I'm talking about, in this context, if we have the ability to do this kind of precision, can we borrow this into the machine tools? I would certainly think it's possible. And this is what I leave as a standing disclaimer with a big man, saying that whatever we are talking about, if it sounds absurd, then don't worry. That's the genesis of perhaps a great idea. I will follow this with a short film on tree labs. And if necessary, uh, should I? I have one more exhibit, but only time permits. So I'll wait for that. Let's show the film. High tech gadgets and equipment are common in Indian homes, offices, and industries today. But how many of them are really made here? Are there any indigenous pioneering world-class laboratories in the same league as IBM Labs, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, etc. in India? Why not? When you compare the global population, India is almost one-fifth. And yet, how much do we really contribute to development of high-quality software or participate in open-source software movements like GNU, Linux, etc., which are transforming the world? Precious little. The word invention is reserved for earth-shaking solutions like Edison's light bulb, Shockley's transistor, and Town's laser. Most of these inventors insist that rather than genius, 
Inventions are a result of a meticulous step-by-step -step process. Is it possible to implement this process and somehow create an environment where creativity, technology and entrepreneurship can come together and trigger a sort of a chain reaction giving birth to widespread wealth creation? If this process can result in inventions, then we can actually invent the inventors. And so with this core idea of the process of think simple, research, enable, evolve, Tree Labs was created. One persistent problem can be observed in virtually all of the technology applications that we see around us today. Energy used by various systems seems to be way too large as compared to the actual work they do. Take for example the water pump. For the work it does, its efficiency is a dismal 5%. For ceiling fans, even less, 1%. There are lots of other systems that show even less than this. There is no concept of regeneration of energy in systems like lifts where the mass that is lifted up also comes down. So net energy consumed is quite large. Stories like this are very, very common. If one could look at the core technologies in any of these applications and reduce the inefficiency at each stage, what could be the result? Following the Tree Labs idea of process of invention, we looked at various technologies. Lampo is just one of the extraordinary outcomes of this process. This discharge lamp technology developed at Tree Labs has been demonstrated to be already more than twice as efficient as white LEDs, which are considered as one of the most efficient sources of light available today. In the near future, with further research, it is projected to improve this by as much as 10 times. Similar results have been replicated in various technologies across the board. To give an idea of what the implications of this are, let us take a look at the invention tree of Tree Labs. If one takes any single area like power electronics, one can see that it covers about 40 to 50 core inventions. One of them is motors which is responsible for approximately 65% of the world's electricity consumption. Like all of the core inventions, motors have about 15 to 20 application areas, traction being one of them. And these in turn have 10 to 15 product lines. So just one core invention affects up to 300 different product lines. And so, the entire invention tree has the potential of perhaps affecting almost 3,75,000 product lines. And a combination of two or more such core inventions can perhaps affect even more areas not obvious in today's scenario. But these inventions are useless if they do not reach society. Entrepreneurship allows inventions to materialize. Entrepreneurship can also be taught and hence entrepreneurs can also be created. But according to data available, the success rate of entrepreneurship ventures seem to be 1 in 2000. Is it really that bad? Why? There are a multitude of reasons where startups can and usually falter. But mostly so because startups often work in relative isolation. Tree Labs will help prevent startup mortality through collective learning and sharing of resources and expertise. This gives rise to the third core idea of Tree Labs. Sharing benefits all. This idea, popularly known as commons, is not uncommon today. An example is the creative commons. The commons is enriched by people sharing their creations. So the vision of Tree Labs is to bring together the three core ideas inventions, entrepreneurship and commons. Tree Labs is an invention and entrepreneurship factory. Its inventions can spawn many daughter companies which will help move these inventions from the lab to the market. As a minority equity partner in these companies, 
The success of these companies will create a revenue stream that will enable Tree Labs to be a financially self-fueling mechanism. But Tree Labs is a Section 25 company. This means that all the revenue coming into Tree Labs, whether by dividends from daughter companies, royalty, donations, etc., is utilized to create a network of laboratories, fabrication workshops, campuses, and a culture for technical creativity. The fruits of this tree has the potential to create a revolution. And the seeds can be sown elsewhere, causing ripples across the globe, creating an international revolution in techno-entrepreneurial creativity. Tree Labs is already demonstrating the feasibility and the phenomenal potential of its vision. But it is evident that the task of taking any core invention to the finish as a part of various possible product lines is enormous and will need support in various forms until it is possible to function independent of external support. So Tree Labs extends its invitation to you to become part of this revolution today. So, thank you. Just a... Yeah. Uh, so, I'm available to answer any questions that you have. And if... Okay, so... Uh, so, what I'll do is... Uh, I have one more... We have time, Gautam? Yes. Five minutes. So, we mentioned in the movie also that we have come up with a lamp which is more than two times energy efficient as compared to white LEDs. This has been peer reviewed and it has been given award, very prestigious award it has been given. So I'm just going to demonstrate that. So here is an early prototype of the lamp. I didn't want to bring, just to tell you that it starts very, very simple. Now what I have, it's a fluorescent lamp. It's a kind of tube that you buy in the market and here is a 6 volt battery which i'll just connect it so what we are talking about here is okay so uh, the the lamp is lit up now mind you you may not be super dazzled by the illumination, but if you were in an environment which is not particularly bright, I mean, including your own home when you have other lights turned off. Here I am being blasted by that light on my face, for example. Now, this is actually sufficiently bright for actual use. This has been field tested in the, but you can switch off the lights. Yeah, just to get a sense. For a moment, your pupils will take a little moment to adjust to it, but you will see that it is actually. Uh, so the point is. Yeah. So, but the main idea that I will want uh, people to just uh, look at it. the main thing is the actual energy being consumed. The actual energy being consumed in this right now is about forty percent that of white LEDs for the light that it is giving out. And most importantly, uh, now here, uh, yeah, I mean, if your eyes get adjusted to it, it's more than a hand uh, eyeful, I would say, for whatever you need to see around. We have used this on treks in the Himalayas, and for whole teams, we have used just a single lamp. And we did not need to charge this little battery for the whole duration of the trek for less than 10 days, because it has been consuming so less. And let me offer, can we turn on the lights again? Yeah. So I would request uh, any volunteer or a couple of people, because number of people. See, the whole idea in this particular thing is this is a standard tube. But we have a little piece of electronics. And it's actually really, really tiny. And you can see there's a little, well, for those people who are far away, you can't. Uh, but I'll request. 
So I will request, there's only one power electronic device here, and it's a transistor, which has a, you know, the package has, it stripped off the top, which is, now in any power electronics, I will request you to just touch it, and tell me if it is, is it hot? No. Not hot. Can you just give your, that's the only thing that can get hot. Uh, would you mind touching the tube itself? Is it hot? No. Now, uh, if, you, if you just happen to touch it and just check, this is the temperature that will continue to be. And I'm sure you, you all have seen tubes which are running the conventional CFLs, if you like. So it is not really super energy efficient. So we do not have, uh, as a professor, I'm used to In this one? Yeah. In this one? Okay, good. The question is, what is the technology I'm showing? The technology I'm showing is actually not about lamps directly, the core technology. The core is, how do you create gaseous plasma energy efficiently? Because plasma, for those of you who understand, is a nasty energetic beast. People find it extremely difficult to control it. The whole nuclear fusion, the tokamaks and all that is about con confining of plasma. It's a, and I including your discharge lamps. Any discharge lamp is about a plasma. So here is a, and plasma has this funny property that it has negative temperature coefficient of resistance. And therefore it becomes unstable to control. To counter that, people have gone through all extents, but everything that they've been doing so far has led to energy inefficient methods. So you have the lamps, but they're not enough efficient. And a few other things, which I'm not uh, talking about. But the main thing that I'm talking about is here, this is a gas discharge. So the core technology, remember the invention stream we are talking about? The core, let's say the core technology is about plasma, uh, control, controlling of gaseous plasma energy efficiently. From that I can form discharge lamps, I can form gas lasers, I can make sputtering systems, and so on and so forth. You can see that it starts to keep growing and growing and growing. The lamp itself, you can start to segment different sub-verticals around the lamps. So therefore, what we are talking about, it, let's think simple about the different things that are possible. So this has been lit up for some time now. Even now, if you touch it, it's going to continue to remain. So simple thinking, if I'm taking energy from this battery, over here, and is not dissipating in this, and is not dissipating here, it must be doing efficiently. Simple as that. The watts right now is approximately 1.7 or 1.8 watts. That's the. And mind you, in the field tests, yes, please. Uh, Lumens. That's right. Yeah. So I, I gave that answer already indirectly, that it is more than two times light output for the same power input as compared to white LEDs. So why, why are we comparing to the white LEDs? Why not to a standard CFL, which is not an LED, no? CF, well, LEDs are supposed to be better than CFLs. Yeah, but we don't know LED. I don't know the No, what I'm talking about is... If I have a 12 watt or an 8 watt uh, CFL, and you are holding, I think, a similar... See, this, watt this one, this tube is rated for 8 watts. Okay. And, I mean, rated in the sense that's a nominal number that you see on the tube, rated. I'm here not talking about this tube per se. In fact, the story is much longer than this uh, limited talk will tell you. If you're interested, I can tell you more. Even the fact that it's a fluorescent tube is a huge, huge negative energy impact. You don't... I mean, this itself is a major handicap for us. That's the fluorescent tube I'm putting in. I mm -hmm. didn't manufacture the tube. I'm just showing you a prototype of a technology that is in existence. And I can show you why fluorescent tubes are bad. No, I'm just asking you, if I have a 8 watt CFL bulb, we can light up so much area and we can all read comfortably. Sure. Right, so we say that that 8 watt bulb is working for a particular room. Mm -hmm. So this technology of yours, how much power would it consume to give the same amount of light? 
would you be happy if it's less than 50 percent? Definitely, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's doing far better than that. <laughs> This is, this is currently taking, and you can feel that anybody is, see it's not heating up anywhere. It's just producing the light, I mean, you just, I mean, ho holding it for a good five minutes now, just feel that the tube or the electronics, anything, just if you touch, nothing is hot. And, okay, that is another matrix to gauge whether the technology is good. So the first merit that I talked about is light output divided by power input. So on that merit, it is doing better than two times, two to three times as compared to white LEDs at the moment. And our research path leads to a lamp. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look at this in the correct perspective. If this is white LEDs, which is supposed to be the best as compared to everything else the world is offering today, this fellow currently what I'm holding is doing more than two times better than this, which is supposed to be the best. But we are not stopping here. That same thing simple is leading us to a lamp over here, which I'm not showing you right now, which is not even on a prototype, but that's the path which led to this lamp. This lamp that we are talking about is almost one order of magnitude, 10 times better than this fellow. So we are really talking about a complete phenomenal change in the way we are thinking of lighting itself. Uh, I, I missed out a question that somebody asked. asked. Cost. Cost, yes. The cost, uh, so that figure of merit is about the efficiency. Now, if I give the light output divided by the cost, this is doing three times better than white LEDs, the commercial ones that you get in the market at the moment. So we believe that because the technology is extremely simple. These are all in the process of patenting, so therefore, sorry? Is it 100 rupees in? Money if you have to count. Less than 100 rupees minus the battery. Okay. In fact, to give you a number, even at this prototype stage, it doesn't exceed 100 rupees. So you can imagine what can happen if you were mass manufacturing it. So with that, should I conclude? Unless there are questions? Friends, uh, uh, Dipankar is going to be here right till the evening. I requested him not to go back till the evening, so you can bug him as much as you want for the rest of the yeah. day. I am pretty certain that he has invoked a lot of interest in all of you, so he's all yours. Uh, Mr. Dipankar, just a moment, please. Huh? Sure. You see, the light may not have heated up. I think you that. Uh, See if the light is cold, but we are all hot now. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to just fail to understand that uh, you're talking of all these energy efficiencies and mm -hmm. all that. Sir, up a little Hello. Ah. Have you patented all these technologies that you are talking of? Are it just your dreams? Are these dreams have been converted into ideas, and ideas have been converted into products, and those products are already in the market? What is the state of affairs now? I think the gentleman has asked a very, very pertinent question. Are these patented? Uh, in fact, before I answer you that question, uh, not everything is patented. And I'll give you the answer. But by the same token, even little things we have been advised by our patent attorneys. So uh, in that connection, those little pieces that I gave you all to just see the welding. Welding things, please return. Please return it to safeguard the interest of the patent lawyer's way of looking at things. But let me answer this. Patenting is, is an extremely expensive process. I do not know how many of you have actually gone through the real patenting that is done internationally by, let's say, these multi-billion dollar turnover companies. Let me offer an example. Typically, it's not just about filing in India. If you file in India, you have only a 12-month window. If you have not gone ahead and filed it elsewhere in the world, appropriate regions, in all those regions, your idea is for grabs. So before you start patenting, putting a filing for the patent in India, you have to make sure that you can back it up with the other costs. 
Now let me tell you, it's not just about cost of filing there also. That itself could sound substantial, but it's not about that. It's the attorney fees. There are people, there are teams which look at infringement of patents. There are teams which will look at what are the, there's a whole spectrum. Then you have the renewal fees, everything put together. A typical multinational company would allocate almost to the tune of anywhere between 100K to 300K USD per patent. You have to make sure that that is available with you, allocated, so that you are not, if you don't follow that process, you're gone. Having said that, now it looks like a large number, 300K US dollars per patent. A technology, if you have to properly patent, let me take the example of white LEDs. White LEDs, the patents for white LEDs are currently held by only five multinational companies internationally. Only five. They collectively hold about 10,000 patents around white LED space. So there's absolutely fort-like boundaries around that for nobody else to come in. It's a cartel. If you multiply those, you are talking about almost what, $300 million that you need to put in the patenting for a technology. Would a startup, would a new, this thing, and mind you, how many patents are we, are we talking about in the graph that we showed? These are astronomical numbers. Yes. So we needed a mechanism, and I think the best mechanism that we could figure out, and some of the wisest people on the planet have given their ideas, we think Freelabs is a very, very good solution for that. Because otherwise, we will just lose out on actual capitalizing on the value of it and enriching, continue to enrich the whole thing. I hope I have given you a, some part of the answer that you see. So the answer is they are all in the process because they cost huge amounts of money. We are engaging commercially to bootstrap the funds into the ideas to make sure that they can be patented adequately. That's the process. And that's why my request was to return those little pieces, just so that we are not handicapped at the stage where we need to really capitalize. Uh, hopefully soon, hopefully you will come forward and pick up. Okay? We are, what we are saying is, that's a community thing. We need business leaders to come and understand the process that is going on, that it is sharing that benefits. Okay? We create a structure called Tree Labs with which we are all interacting to make sure that we can each spin out our own uh, little carved out space in which we do business and become as big as we want. Out on the, in open source, so to say. A again, a very good question. Uh, it has several angles to it. Uh, I, I hope everybody understood the question. I have been talking about open source as examples and I'm a huge enthusiast, fan, devotee of open source. Why are we not putting these inventions in open source? The nature of the things is that if you do put in open source, what happens? These are actually, these remarks that I'm going to make is based on actual examples. If you put a software in open source, all that it requires for somebody else to use that software is copy. No big, you just download, and it's there for you to use. If you put the idea of a lamp in open source, can the average user make it? It requires manufacturing. Who sets up the factories? Who sets up the quality assurance systems? Who, sorry? Oh, if it, if it happens that way, if it happens that way, that will be wonderful. And Tree Labs's ultimate goal is to reach that stage but you need bootstrapping to be happening. Who pays upfront $300 million for patenting? I would like to see raise of hand. You said 300,000 and now it's 300 million. I'm, no, 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 but I'm saying who is going to manufacture it? See, the point is you are going to take this and you're going to manufacture. Are you going to contribute to R&D for the next product to come out? What, what led to, I may put it, I may put right now, say, okay, I'm so, I, I put this technology on the table, up for grabs for the world. But I'm talking about, what about 
the next thing that has to come on this table. That is the excuse given by all MNCs, no? Why they need to charge so high prices? Sorry? Because their R&D cost is very high. Sorry? See, if you look at typically, I'll give you the example of the pharma industry, which is, you know, used patenting very powerfully to keep their pricing at a very exorbitant level. Oh, Why are my prices high? Because I pay my scientists so high, which actually is not the truth, but that's how they justify it. Mm -hmm. And because I need to keep them sustained to generate more and more new molecules. So that's the excuse given and that's the same excuse you are giving us. It's not an excuse. What we are saying no, is… I, I, I'm just saying… Because this. what we are creating is saying an enterprise… Saying this to provoke the discussion, yeah. Okay. No, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. No, I… Uh, can you repeat the question? What is the business model? Uh, maybe some of my colleagues are here. We should take this offline because it's not a short answer. I think yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of discussion that is required for that. And uh, I think till evening we'll be discussing this uh, this route. So I think that's why I have trapped all of them and told them <laughs> you're not going anywhere until you meet everybody who wants to meet you by evening. So we have them uh, maybe. captive in Lavasa. The, one of the benefits of Lavasa is that we can hold people captive here. Thank you. So, so friends, uh, with this, yeah, the sample pieces, please, whoever has those sample pieces, please, 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 please return. Please return those sample pieces wherever they are. Okay, friends, so I think from the interest shown by all of you, this has been an interesting session. I, I got a few uh, words from this whole thing, change the world, invent the inventor, entrepreneurs can be made, and everything in the commons, the core values of Tree Labs. Uh, Dipankar, thank you so very much for coming here and uh, being with us and spending time with us. Uh, can I... Give you a small momento on behalf of...